Good morning, City Point family. It's so good to be here. I am loving this series. I hope you guys are too. Uh, I hope too that you're starting to feel more and more a part of what's going on here on earth, the things that God is doing. I hope that you guys can say, I'm in when this is all said and done. Um, just to remind you, we've been doing this, we've been covering this series for the last four weeks, and we started off with um, these words that we feel like are like are God's, maybe not commands, but invitations. There's another N, um, invitations to us. And so week one, we talked about um, that we are invited into God's family. That there is an invitation for you to come into God's family because Jesus invites the people that others reject. The next week we talked about um, invaluable, that you are invaluable to God's body. You're, in, you're an invaluable part of God's body, uniquely created and called to make a difference in his kingdom. You are a part of what God is doing. And then last week we talked about I'm influential. Oh, I went backwards. You guys are influential. I didn't know, I don't know if you knew that, but you were an influencer. You don't have to have an Instagram page to be an influencer. You have no idea how one conversation, one word of encouragement, one expression of love might change someone's life for eternity. And so today we're ending the series uh, with another word from God. You are invested in God's kingdom. God created us to pour out his blessings, not store them up for ourselves. God created us, me and you, to pour out his blessings, not store them up for ourselves. And so we kind of are doing this in place of normally this time of year we have our um, uh, small groups, we call them city groups, invitation. And we're just going to use this as an invitation because you are in, you are invited, you are invaluable, you are influential, you are invested. And so this is our invitation to get involved. No matter where you are in life, there is a group here at City Point for you. And so we just encourage you to jump in with both feet. Um, so today we're going to talk about invested. And you might be at a place that you don't feel very invested. Maybe this is your first week here. And uh, you can already tell that we might be talking about money today, and that's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but hopefully by the end of this, you can see that whether, whether you feel like you're invested or not, you are investing in something. Think about that for a second. Whether you feel invested or not, you are invested in something. You want to know what that is? Well, just take a look at how you spend your time, and then you'll get an idea of what you're invested in. Think about the way that you spend your money and the things that you spend your money on, and that will give you an idea of what you're invested in. You are investing. The problem is many of us are investing things, are investing in things that won't last. We're investing in things that won't last. So hopefully today as we talk, you can be thinking about how you are investing and whether those things that you are investing in are temporary things or eternal things. Um, Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, talks about investing. And he says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moth eats them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Jesus says, don't store up. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're called not to store up, but to pour out his blessings. It's, he also said, and this is recorded in Acts, that it's better to give than to receive. And I think you guys can already see that. I know I've heard you're not going to be laying on your deathbed and think, man, I wish I had spent money on fill in the blank. I wish I had bought more. I wish there was that one item that I had actually gotten in life, that bucket list item. But I know that I regularly hear about the blessing that comes through giving, through seeing a need and then meeting that need, being the body of Christ. So we don't have spending stories, but many of us do have giving stories. 
You might feel like you aren't in a place to give right now, right? The economy is pretty rough. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to make ends meet. Maybe you're one of those people, and I've been there before, that have thought, I'm just not at a place to give right now, whatever the need is. When I have more or when I'm in a better place, then I'll have the ability to give more. Um, We see this um, throughout the Old Testament, that it wasn't about the amount that mattered. It was about the attitude. Oftentimes, tithing is brought up in in conversations about investment. And you can't talk about tithing without talking about 10%. That's literally what tithing means. But if we look back at the Old Testament, tithing was only part of the yearly worship that the Jews went through. They also had things like first fruits and free will offerings. They were at the temple all the time thanking God for what he was doing in their, in their life and giving and giving and giving. They also had specific t- uh, offerings just for the poor in the community. Sometimes that involved not reaping your entire field, but leaving a section for those who were in need. But oftentimes it meant just giving freely to those who were needy in the, needing in the community. So this idea of when I have more, I'll give more. When I'm in a better place, then I'll better be able to give. I think that goes along with um, the scarcity mindset. You might have heard of that before. It's, It's from the book Seven Habits of a Highly Effective Person by Stephen Covey or Covey, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his name, but this scarcity mindset is the belief that there is a limited amount of success, that there's a limited amount of resources and and opportunities in the world. And the problem is you will never have enough because the underlying understanding is that there isn't enough even available to begin with. So this scarcity mindset is for me to have more, somebody else has to have less, and for them to have more, then I have to have less scarcity mindset. Jesus addresses this in a parable. A man comes to Jesus and asks Jesus to be in charge of splitting his father's estate between him and his brother. That's a weird thing to ask Jesus to do. Will you kind of come in and make sure that I have enough? And Jesus tells this parable. Um, In the Bible, in your heading, you might see it called the rich fool. And this is a painting by Rembrandt. This is Rembrandt's rendition of the rich fool. Some some art historians think that this is a picture or like this is a likeness of his father, which might say something about him and his father's relationship. But the way that the parable goes is there is this man who is a farmer. So he's 100% dependent on God's sovereignty over the wealth in his life. And he has this one year where he reaps more abundantly than he has in the in the past, and he runs into this problem of what do, what can I do with the excess, right? It's more than I've ever reaped before. What can I do? And so his response to that is, I will build bigger barns, and I will store up so that I will have more in life and be able to retire and be comfortable. So I will build bigger barns, and I will store up. And this is the only parable that Jesus tells where God is a character in the parable. Did you guys know that? All the others are just stories, but God shows up in this parable. And he shows up in a really interesting way. This rich fool has just said, I will build bigger barns and I will store up so that I won't have to worry about the future. And this is God's reply. Oh, sorry, this isn't God's reply. God's reply is, you fool, right? That's why it's called the rich fool. He says, you fool, storing up, your life will be demanded of you this very night. And he dies before he's ever able to do anything with this amazing store. And the moral of the story, Jesus gives it to us right at the end there, Luke 12, 21. Yes, a person is a fool to store up up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. It's not about the amount that you give. It's about the attitude that you have. It's foolish to store up earthly wealth at the expense of your relationship with God. 
Now, this man, he was driven by fear, right, of the future, what the future might hold. And so that caused him to have this desire. And it's not wrong to plan for the future. Let's go ahead and say that. It's not wrong to plan for the future. It's not wrong to be responsible for those who God has put in your care. The issue here was the attitude. He was storing up for himself instead of pouring out the blessings that God had given him. The opposite of this scarcity mindset, that there isn't enough to go around, that for me to have more, someone else to have, has to have less, is the abundance mindset. So that's the belief that there are enough resources, that there are enough success, there is enough opportunity for everyone. And how much more is that true when you're talking about the creator of the universe? There's another story in scripture where, where Jesus contrasts these two ideas. Um, you can find it in every gospel. This is one of the few stories that is recorded in every gospel, and it's the feeding of the multitude. In fact, this was such an important message of Jesus that it happened more than once, that he feeds the multitude. And so we're going to talk about the account in Matthew. You can find it in Matthew chapter 14. And what is happening is the, the crowds follow Jesus wherever he goes. And he can't get away. No matter, he crosses the Sea of Galilee, they meet him on the other side. They want to hear what Jesus has to say. And they know that he speaks with power and that there is healing in his hands. So they're also bringing their sick for Jesus to heal. And so this one day, Jesus has spent the whole day teaching and healing, and now it's getting on in the day, and they've been doing this for a while, and the disciples are getting a little antsy. And we pick up in Matthew 14, verse 15. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. So the disciples are talking to Jesus, and they're saying, send these people away so that they can go and get help. Sometimes this is our prayer. And I mean, the disciples, technically, they're praying, right? They're talking to Jesus. But they saw a need, and their response was to go to Jesus and pray that Jesus has some kind of solution for this need that they've seen. And then the next verse records Jesus' reply. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. <laughs> now, in this chapter, it's called feeding the multitude, and it's because we don't know exactly how many people were there that day. But we know for sure there were 5,000 men. And according to historical accounts, if there were 5,000 men, there were probably somewhere between 15 and 20,000 people. That's a lot of hungry mouths to feed. And so the disciples, they saw a need, and they felt like, that's not a need that I can meet. So I'm going to pray that Jesus can meet this need. And his response was, you feed them. And the disciples illustrate perfectly the, um, oh shoot, I'll, I, my mind went blank, scarcity mindset. They illustrate perfectly the scarcity mindset by saying, but we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. But we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Now, if anybody should be allowed to have a scarcity mindset, it's probably this situation where you got 20,000 people and you're faced with five loaves and two fish. So they're sitting there dealing with a scarcity mindset. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, bring them here. He asks the disciples and this little boy, obviously, who's involved because it's his lunch, just give me what you've got. Bring them here. And then it says, he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. They all ate 
as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. Do you think Jesus was trying to make a point to the disciples who thought there might not be enough? 12 baskets of leftovers. It's important to, to realize here, too, when the disciples had the five loaves and the two fish, they were probably thinking, this isn't even enough for us, right? Five loaves, two fish, 12 disciples, Jesus, this little boy, we're not going to let him go hungry. He's the one who brought it. It's not even enough for us. And the fish wasn't multiplied when they were hanging on to it. But what happened? The disciples gave what they had, Jesus blessed it, and then the disciples distributed it. And in that distributing, God multiplied what was available. Because what's available with God is so much more than what we might have on hand. Here's something to think about. What you keep is all you will ever have. What you keep is all you will ever have. But what you give, God multiplies. And this is about food. Oftentimes this is talked about with, with money. But this is the eternal life that Scripture is speaking of. This is the beginning of the future eternity that we are going to live out. When it says in John 3, 16, that whoever believes in Jesus will have eternal life, that eternal life is starting right now. And so whatever you're willing to give to God, he's willing to multiply. God didn't give more when the disciples stored up those five loaves and two fish. God gave more when they poured it out to the group that was there. It's also interesting, too, this happens again. The second account is recorded in Matthew and also in Mark. And they're, they're similar accounts, but it's a different number of people and a different number of loaves, loaves and fish. And to me, I always kind of um, look down on the disciples a little bit. Like, it just happened, guys. Like, he just fed 20,000 people. And they're coming to Jesus again, just a few chapters later in both Gospels, to say, look, Jesus, there are loads of people here, and they're all hungry, and all we have is only, what are we going to do? Do they not remember what Jesus had just done? But we do that same thing in our very own lives. We start to experience something difficult, and we forget all the times that he's come through before, and we think, well, this is, <laughs> I only have this much in my, in my bank account. I only am able to spend this much time with my kids. I only can put up with so much at work. I only, I only, I only, and we forget about how much he can do when we're willing to give what we have up. It's also important to not talk about a percentage. I know tithe and 10%, they go together. They, tithe means 10%. But when it comes to my kids, am I gonna give God 10% of my kids? No, I want them all to be blessed, so I'm gonna give him all of my kids. When it comes to my marriage, do I want God to bless 10% of my marriage or all of my marriage? Well, then that means I got to give all of my marriage to him. When you keep, that's all you'll ever have. But what you give, God multiplies. I was reminded this week of a hymn, and so I needed to look up the story of that person. And so we're going to talk about Francis Ridley Havergal. You guys might not have heard from, of her before. The writers of these hymns tend to fall into obscurity a little bit. Um, but she lived in the, in the 1800s, 1836 to 1879, died fairly young. And she was the daughter of a clergyman. And they recognized pretty early on that she was gifted, that God had given this little girl a gift. And so she's most well known for her writing. She wrote poetry and prose and hymns, obviously we're going to talk about. Um, she also sang 
And she also gave extravagantly. And it's all recorded. She, she, because of her gift of writing, she took journals. And so we can go back and look into her life. Later in life, around my age, early 40s, 41, she found out that she was getting sick and that she wasn't ever going to recover. She wasn't ever going to be healthy again. And so it was getting close to the end. And when she was presented with this information, she said, if I am going, it is too good to be true. When you pour your life out and you see what God does with it, you can't help but write a song that goes something like this. Oh, I'm going to skip this quote. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. If you don't know what consecrated means, it means set apart for the purpose that God has for it. So she prays, Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated to you. Take my moments and my days, my time, and let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love and take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful to thee. Are you willing to give your hands the tasks that you do and your feet the places that you go? Are you willing to give that to God? She wrote, take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite. It's the smallest piece of currency. Not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. She's praying here that her will, the choices that she makes, the things that she has most control over, that she would align those with God's will and that in giving God her will, her choices, that he would also take her heart, the desires that she has and make them his. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store and then all of it, take myself, and I will be ever, only, all for thee. Man, guys, that's been my prayer this week, that I will be ever, only, all for God. We're called and created to pour out God's blessings into the world, not to store it for, our, for ourselves, because whatever we keep, that's all we will ever have. But those things that we're willing to give to God, he's going to multiply in his abundance, in his abundance. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your abundant love and provision. You've called us to be vessels, pouring out what you've given us to bless others. Help us trust you with all we have, knowing that you are more than enough. Let us have the attitude of that immoral woman from week one, Lord, who poured her perfume, her most prized possession at your feet because she knew if you were powerful enough to forgive her of her sins and good enough to invite her into your family, then you are powerful enough and good enough to provide for our every need. Shift our hearts, Father from fear to faith, from scarcity to abundance. We surrender our lives, our time, our finances, our relationships, our difficult situations. We surrender them to you for your work. Use us for your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Y'all stand up, let's sing the song.
Can we sing it one more time, church? I encourage you guys this week. May we be a people who have that prayer ever, only, all for God because our lives will be changed. Our broken, temporary, poor life is going to be filled with eternity in every area that you're willing to give to Him. May we be those kind of people so that that light shines in the world around us. We're done with I'm in. Can I hear you guys say I'm in? If, if you don't fill in, if you're like, I don't fill in on God's family, I, I would love to pray, pray for you today. Mark would love to pray for you. Tammy would love to pray with you today because you are invited into God's family. If you feel like you're in, not invaluable, like you're, you're not part of God's body, you are part of God's body. We'd love to help you get plugged in somewhere. If you feel like you're not very influential in this world, let me tell you right now, the world's eyes are on you and as your life fills with eternity that speaks volumes no matter what platform you're on and may we be a people that are invested in God's future so we're done we're done with I'm in next week we start a new series that's going to carry us through the election and it's called the God of promise we're going to focus on Second Chronicles where it says, God says, if my people who are called by my name, if you read that in scripture, that's talking about you. So you should pay attention. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive them their sins and heal their land. He is a God of promise. Let's get back together next week and talk about it. Fist bump the person next to you. You guys are dismissed. Yeah.